Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Jokia Rogers. Today we begin in Somalia where the country's president, Hassan Sheikh Mohammed, has disbanded the country's Judicial Service Commission and Anti-Corruption Commission. According to the state media, in a decree that was declared on Sunday, the president instructed the cabinet to form the commissions afresh. The Judicial Service Commission is a body that oversees the operations of the judiciary and recruits judges. The commission was appointed two years ago and made an opera by opposition parties who argue that the caretaker committee lacks the mandate to approve members of the body. And Chad's military ruler, Mahamad Debi, will be sworn in as the transitional president today. The ruler will be extending his stay in power by two years following recommendations from a contentious national inclusive dialogue process that concluded last week. Various opposition groups, the Catholic Church and rebels responsible for last year's killings of General Mohammed's father, Idris Debi, boycotted the talks amid aimed at determining Chad's political future. The United States warned it would impose sanctions on the ruling junta if it extended the transition. The African Union similarly warned Chad against extending the tradition, a transition. General Mohammed, who will be eligible for future elections, has pledged to ensure institutional reforms, including adopting a new constitution, an electoral code, and creating a new election commission. Lack of consensus over the transition could worsen political tensions and a long-running rebellion in the country. And the trial of former Liberian rebel commander Kunti Kamara opens on Monday in a Paris court. Mr. Kamara, who is on trial under universal jurisdiction and international law that recognizes that the prosecution of certain crimes transcends all borders, is accused of rape, murder, and torture during the country's first civil war in the 1990s. He, however, denies the accusations. According to French state media, his lawyer says since the start, Mr. Kunti Kamara has indicated that he has nothing to do with these events, that he is not involved in the crimes he is being accused of. Mr. Kamara was arrested in France in 2018. Ukraine's Foreign Minister Dmitry Kuleba has cut short his trip to Africa amid Russian strikes across his country. Mr. Kuleba tweeted, I am in constant contact with partners since early morning today to coordinate a resolute response to Russian attacks. I'm also interrupting my Africa tour and heading back to Ukraine immediately. He has been on an apparent counteroffensive tour following a visit to the continent by Russia's top diplomat. Sergei Lavrov in July. He has been to Senegal, Ivory Coast and Ghana during the trip. Ukraine President Volodymyr Zelensky has repeatedly made overtures to African leaders to condemn Russia over its invasion of his country. Let's get more on this. Let's go talk to security expert David Otto for more perspective on these security issues. He joins us virtually from London. You're welcome to Network Africa. Thank you, Joke. So let's begin with the trial of former Liberian rebel commander Kunti Kamara, who has been accused of rape, murder and torture during the country's first civil war in the 1990s, which he denied. What are your thoughts on this trial? Uh, of course, I mean, this um, uh, is in very um, direct relation, as you know, to the, um, the the war that happened in Sierra Leone, which was very much linked to the war in Liberia in the 1990s. And of course, um, uh, you know, without, you know, carrying out any media trial in this case, you know, I think uh, it's important to know that, you know, uh, one of the biggest warlords, you know, uh, Charles Taylor uh, himself, who was arrested in 2006, uh, was tried at the Hague and was sentenced to uh, 50 years imprisonment. Uh, but, but of course, we're not talking about just Taylor. We're talking about another individual who indeed um, opposed, um, you know, the then Liberian president, Charles Taylor. I mean, this uh, uh, Kunti Kamara himself, you know, he has been um, designated, you know, as the leader of the United Liberation Movement of Liberia for Democracy. They call it uh, the ULIMO. But he denies that, one, he was the leader of that movement, uh, which was an armed group that opposed um, the Liberian president, Charles Taylor. 
and he says that um, he was just a soldier. Uh, but, but the crimes against him are, are quite heinous. I mean, we're talking about murder, rape, uh, torture. Um, these are very serious human rights violations which occurred between 1992 and 1997. Uh, and of course, um, again, you know, as I said, he has denied uh, all allegations and he has made it very clear uh, that he has nothing uh, to do uh, with this crisis. But let's be very clear here, uh, the war in Liberia and Sierra Leone was a very significant war. Uh, for the first time, uh, we saw the um, uh, what, what used to be called the ECOMOV, that's the ECOWAS um, you know, uh, military group, uh, which you know, was um, fairly represented or, or by Nigerian forces, but also by other West African forces. Uh, and I often uh, listen to uh, Nigerian soldiers talking about how those days were very um, glorious you know, for the Nigerian army. But back to the trial, I think we still have to wait for uh, the verdict, as you know, he clearly uh, is denying all allegations. And so let's move on to you know another uh, figure, Chad's military ruler, General Mohammed Debi, will be sworn in as a transitional president uh, today, thereby extending his stay in power by two years. Uh, what do you think uh, this will do for the country's political future? I think it's very significant, you know, because of course not just for Chad itself. Uh, Chad is a very powerful. A contributor to the counterinsurgency operations in the Lake Chad. Uh, you know, during the time of, of his father, um, uh, Idris Debi Sino himself, you know, uh, they had helped uh, or come to the rescue of Nigeria on so many uh, occasions. You know, but I often say that this is some kind of a, uh, a regional um, affair. You know, Charles also, um, you know, Chad also wanted to make sure that um, it does secure its own borders. Um, but, you know, the, the killing or the alleged, you know, a killing of, um, you know, Idris Debi in the war front uh, led to a constitutional coup. I mean, uh, some of the opposition have described it more or less as an institutional coup. But I think it's, it's one of those constitutional coups uh, because, of course, um, uh, Muhammad, or General Muhammad, you know, who is now the president, uh, you know, uh, he, you know, took power, you know, by force. Uh, because, of course, you know, power was meant to go into the hands of the um, Speaker of the Assembly. But what the opposition has been saying, and one of the reasons why they've opposed, uh, you know, uh, this uh, regime, you know, despite uh, so many calls from Doha uh, to, you know, have some kind of a peaceful resolution, is that, um, you know, um, this cannot be a monarchy. You know, he cannot take a, um, power from uh, his father as he, as he has done. And, of course, he has been supported a lot by France. Um, so we don't know if, you know, him staying in power for the next two years is going to bring any form of stability because, of course, uh, most of the opposition groups uh, are not happy with this move. And the United States and the African Union have warned of imposing sanctions on the ruling junta in, in Chad if it extended the transitional plan. Uh, what do you make of this? Uh, yes, of course. I mean, I think I would like to hear that more from, you know, regional bodies, you know, rather than the, uh, the, the United Nations. You know, I think I'm more interested to see what the, um, you know, the African Union will do, uh, because, of course, you know, I'm much more uh, inclined to, um, you know, leave this in the hands of, um, you know, regional organizations, you know, within uh, Africa. But, but perhaps also, you know, I think I see some role uh, by other neighboring states, you know, to try and persuade um, you know, um, uh, Idris uh, Debi um, Jr., uh, Muhammad, uh, to hand over power, uh, you know, in the 18 months period that he did promise. Uh, I think it's going to be a very contentious issue because, of course, you know, there is a huge family affair um, when it comes to the political situation in Chad, uh, as we've seen in, in recent uh, struggles. And, and, of course, you know, that is one of the, uh, the issues that, you know, led apparently uh, to the killing of um, Idris Deby in the war front. But what is very clear is that, you know, uh, Chad needs a, a, some stability. I mean, at least, you know, because it's one of the most reliable uh, contributing countries to counterinsurgency. Uh, and if it does, you know, has that stability, countries like Nigeria, Cameroon, Niger, uh, but, but of course the rest of the countries in the Sahel uh, will have some reliable partnership, you know, when it comes to um, the accountants against your operations. At, at this point in time, uncertainty is the only certainty. 
Right, so let's talk about partnerships as we swerve to yet another development uh, in Ukraine, although somewhat it affects Africa. Uh, Foreign Minister Dimitro Kuleba has caught short his trip to the continent amid Russian strikes across his country. Uh, he says he's touring Africa to, you know, get some sort of support from the continent uh, because of the war. Uh, what really is the significance of this tour to Africa? I think it's a very significant move by Ukraine. Uh, but what one has to be very clear uh, is that you do not make friends, you know, during, you know, crisis period as much as you would do before. Um, one thing which, you know, uh, one has to be um, sure here is that Ukraine uh, has not been very much involved, you know, in in touring African states, you know, before the uh, the, the the invasion of. Um, uh, of Ukraine by Russia, what Russia terms a, a military operation, uh, and the West, you know, terms it, you know, a war of aggression. Uh, I think, you know, perhaps again, it's it's an important move for uh, for Ukraine, uh, but I don't know how much, you know, that will go deep into the uh, the African states, you know, who have, you know, established in the, their position in the last UN uh, Security Council um, April, I think March or April uh, meeting where. African countries that supported, uh, you know, uh, the, you know, Russia. Well, not support Russia, but abstain, you know, from, uh, uh, um, you know, any votes, you know, that, you know, were meant to condemn the, the Russian invasion. I don't think, you know, his tour would change any of that, uh, because we've seen, uh, you know, France do the same. We've seen the United States uh, Foreign Secretary, uh, you know, has done the same. We, we've seen the Russian uh, Foreign Minister. He's visited Africa. Africa is a playground, uh, and, you know, it must be able to understand that it has a very powerful position. But whatever decision that African states make, uh, I think one thing has to be very clear. They have to make that decision uh, on the basis of their own interest, and, and not in the interest of, of, of either of Ukraine, you know, the U.S., or any other Western power. If their interest is met uh, as a result of Africans' interest being met, uh, then, you know, um, that's good for them. Uh, but, but I think, you know, his visit will change little. Uh, and it comes a little bit too late, in my opinion. Right, security expert David Otto, thank you so much for your time today on Network Africa. Thank you. Authorities in the embattled Ethiopian region of Tigray have accused the federal government and its Eritrean allies of launching an indiscriminate artillery bombardment of civilian areas. They've used, urged members of the Tigrayan public to join the fighting. The regional administration said attacks were concentrated in areas close to the Eritrean border, including Rama and Adigrat. Ethiopia and Eritrea have yet to comment. Peace talks organized by the African Union, which were due to begin this week in uh, South Africa, have been postponed for what has been described as logistical reasons. Fighting in the two-year civil war resumed in August after a month-long truce. The United Nations has urged authorities in Libya to order a swift, independent and transparent investigation into the killing of 15 migrants near the coastal city of Sabratha. The bodies were found on Friday, most of them burned inside a charred boat. The UN mission in Libya said the killings were thought to have resulted from clashes between rival trafficking gangs and is demanding that the perpetrators be brought to justice. Libya has long been a key route for the smuggling of migrants to Europe. Elsewhere, the South African Police Service says a 21-year-old man will be charged with murder following the discovery of six bodies, five of them in an advanced state of decomposition, in a building in the main city of Johannesburg. Police launched an investigation after complaints of a foul smell coming from one of the rooms in the building. According to police statement, the body of a woman was discovered in the building and her clothes matched the description of a woman reported missing earlier this month. The statement adds that five more bodies were found outside where there is a makeshift workshop and rubbish dumpsters. The 21-year-old man, who is believed to be the last person to have been seen with the woman, had, had been arrested. He is to be charged with six counts of murder. However, police have not yet given a possible motive for the killing. An Egyptian water treatment company has devised a mobile water uh, 
desalination unit uses solar energy to treat underground water from salinity and minerals to be used for drinking and irrigation. Uh, this will device uh, offer so this device will offer solutions to farmers in the country. Due to fresh water scarcity, farmers depend heavily on underground water, which has high levels of salinity and could kill the crops. The newly designed water desalination model decreases the salinity from over 1,000 parts per million to under 200 parts per million, making it usable for drinking as well as irrigation. I have 50 feathers of mango crops, of which 30% died due to salinity of water. The well which we used to irrigate the crops had a salinity of 1,700 ppm. Regarding the defect from water salinity, there are none, and the evidence is clear. The desalination units can be put in containers, making it a mobile system to reach different areas. It can also be attached to a solar power grid sufficient to run the unit as well as other services. The unit has a production capacity of 600 cubic meters per day. We have managed to provide pure drinkable water in remote areas which suffered severe water scarcity and people there were suffering from the lack of drinkable water. This is in terms of drinkable water. In the farming sector, we were able to treat the water in over 35 farms to be used to solve the problems in agriculture. Water scarcity and salinity are some of the climate challenges for Egypt, a country with a rapidly growing population that's already heavily dependent on food imports. In continuation of our series of reports on crude oil theft in Nigeria, the Afremo uh, platform in an offshore oil installation belonging to Shell Petroleum Development Company has allegedly been identified as one of the stolen crude division facilities used by vandals. Our senior correspondent, Olu Phillips, brings us the details in this next report. Whether through the legitimate oil sale by the federal government and now the outrageous and audacious stealing and refining, Nigeria's sweet crude is having a sore commentary in recent times. Stories now abound in public domain following our reports on the extent of theft and consequences seen in the sharp drop of production numbers for one of OPEC's significant members. Earlier, Channel's television brought you exclusive pictures the first by any media station in Nigeria of one of the suspected tilling points. That offshore platform is known as the Afremo A platform offshore Escarbos and is owned by Shell Petroleum Development Company of Nigeria. So this oil platform has three main pipelines traveling from here all the way to Escarbos and it is buried over the sea and through this swamp. This is what happens, there are three lines here. This is the test line, and that's the line they have decided to use. So it tells you that this is very active. If you look at this, this line, you see that it's not active. Everything around here is dried. The same with that other one. You can see the screws, the knots are all dried up. But if you see this place, it, it raises suspicion. Now, whenever they're ready to um, siphon oil, they remove this, tighten it all back. It tells you, look at this, it tells you that this is active. This is very active. I mean, it's not well screwed and all of that. So it tells you they do this regularly. They open this valve. Um, of course, this travels all the way into onshore. So it goes all the way whenever they are ready. You can see that there's nothing connected to this exit point. Uh, it's a test line. It is not supposed to be an active line. But look at this. This tells you there's been a fresh uh, onslaught. There's been fresh. Uh, discharge from this point. This is crude, not engine oil, not any other thing. This is crude. So they connect a hose to this place 
and run it to a vessel, a flatbed vessel, not the very big ones, a flat vessel, uh, flat, uh, bed vessel that can take uh, between like uh, four or five tons to about six tons because of the draft of this side of the water. And so how do you know that this is an active platform? Because if it wasn't, um, look at this place. Look at this. Look at this. The same point. This is active crude. If this wasn't active, then this crude shouldn't be here. Look at it. This is crude oil. It should be sealed up like this, or sealed up like this, covered. We see. So where is the cover of this pipe is the question. We asked Shell's representative what they knew of this connection or why, despite their claimed surveillance apparatus, didn't capture this. We did not know of this until when our guys discovered it, when they doing grab project. When was that? That was on the 1st of uh, this month of October. Just one month ago. Just one week ago. Interesting. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go to the next one. Interesting. Interesting. One week ago. Given the number of years this might have gone on, the quantity stolen will fall in the region of millions. It was a daring undertaking to follow the crude line to this 2.5 miles location using boats, but an effort worth the risk. No one expects the scale of investigation to be meager. What will be interesting and deterring will be the sheer number of persons who may be involved in this years of suspected bracket and how they will be prosecuted, especially how retribution will be made to the country Nigeria. Olu Phillips, Channel Television News. Amazing discovering indeed our senior correspondent Olu Phillips uh, reporting there. Let's move on to other stories. Foreign ministers of Egypt and Greece met in Cairo on Sunday following controversial maritime and gas deals that their shared rival Turkey signed with a Libyan leader. Cairo and Athens have strengthened ties in recent years, including cooperation in developing energy resources, combating terrorism, and signing new maritime border agreements with Cyprus. At a joint news conference, Greek Foreign Minister Nikos Dendias said talks with his Egyptian counterpart, Samir Shokri, focused on the memorandums of understanding between Turkey and Abdul Hamid uh, Deba, the leader of one of the two competing governments in divided Libya. He said such agreements were a threat to regional stability. And Ugandan pop star turned politician Robert uh, Kyagulanyi, popularly known as Bobby Wine, says he was detained in Dubai at the weekend after arriving there to perform at a music concert. He says he was held at the airport for 12 hours and was questioned about his political party, family and other personal details. He was later released without charge at the concert, whose proceeds were meant to benefit African migrants in the Gulf country, was later cancelled. Mr. Kyagulanyi has blamed Uganda embassy officials for the cancellation of his music concert. He participated in last year's presidential election, which he lost to the incumbent, Yoweri Museveni. That's Network Africa. Thank you for watching. I'm Jokia Rogers.